Hey everybody, my name is Matt. I'm excited to be your host here and welcome to Southridge Church Online. You know, we're a church that's on a mission and that mission is to see lives changed and fulfilled in Jesus. So it is our hope and prayer that we all, all of us take one step closer to Jesus today. We believe that you do that by being real and genuine with him. So let's get real. Let's just get real with God and, and hang out with him over the next hour or so and just be open to whatever he's gonna speak specifically to you. Now, we are, there's a lot of stuff going on at Southridge. We've got two locations. We have a location in Little Bohemia, South Omaha, at, we call it our New Hope Campus, and we have one in Papillion, which is where I'm at here today. Um, and we've got lots of stuff happening in each of the locations, so please go out to southridgelife.com, check it out, see what's going on, um, maybe come and do a visit with us either way and uh, either location and just hang out, all right? Now, we want to celebrate a little bit. We had a huge event this last week, and it was um, our One Day Food Day. So we're doing this big thing with Kingdom Builders, and it's all about one day to feed the world. So what we, we talk a lot about Kingdom Builders and what that's all about, but it's one of the things that I'll kind of simply say that it's about local and global missions. And it's one of those ways that we can give back. So locally, we just did this big food distribution, um, which was awesome. We had cars lined up and uh, we were giving away food. We partnered with Convoy of Hope. We partnered with USDA. It was awesome. So thank you, thank you if you were able to participate and be a part of that. Next up is this next week, Easter Sunday, we are gonna, we're partnering with Convoy and we're gonna do the one day to feed the world. Basically, it's our one day's wages that we're gonna give so that we can help feed and fund um, these uh, feeding programs all around the world, global, right? And how we can help with um, uh, partnering with uh, single parents and, and um, women to uh, start businesses and to do really neat things. So it's, it's not just about giving them fish, it's about teaching them how to fish. We've got a short video, so let's watch the video and I'll come right back. I went through a lot of ups and downs when my husband died. After he passed, I had to become stronger and I struggled to provide for my children. My daughter told me that food would be provided for her at school through Convoy of Hope. I was overjoyed because I didn't have to worry about her being hungry anymore. Through my daughter's participation in the feeding program, I learned about Convoy's Women's Empowerment Program. Since 2010, more than 3,000 women, destitute women, uh, in absolute poverty have been economically empowered. We are uh, taking the mothers of the school feeding children and bring them to our Women Economic Empowerment Program so that sustainably they can feed their children in the future. Through the training, we learned how to make injera and how to run a business. After I joined the Women's Empowerment Project, I have seen so many changes in my family's life. I don't worry because I'm not in debt anymore. I have money to buy food and I can provide for my children. I even have a savings. Women who cannot eat daily, now beyond that, they have started saving, they have expanded their businesses, they have expanded their income, they are improving the livelihood of their children, so they are models in the community. The community is learning much from them. That's amazing. I can't even express my happiness because I never expected days like this would come. The help we received from the Women's Empowerment and Children's Feeding Programs has changed our lives. If my husband was alive, he would be proud. Thank you very, very much. Isn't that awesome? Our one day's wages. Now here's, here's the deal. All we ask is that you pray and you seek God and ask him what you would have to give. I know we talk about the one day's wages, but it's all about being obedient to whatever God would have you give to this one day to feed the world. Last year, we gave like $20,000. It was awesome. So I'm praying for, we're praying for as a church that we can impact this even bigger this next year. I don't know what that number is gonna be, but I'm excited about what God's gonna do through us for one day to feed the world.
So pray about it and let's commit to bringing our tithes, bringing our offerings for the kingdom builders for that week. Now for Easter, um, the other thing is you can give online, you can do all that stuff and I'll talk more about that later. Next up, we are uh, continuing the life of Jesus as according to the book of Matthew and with you are God's passion. And uh, so Troy is talking to us today about uh, the price that was paid. So let's get after it. Well, hey, Southridge, want to welcome you back to another uh, edition, if you will, of Southridge Church Online. Uh, hopefully you are being blessed and God has been doing great things in your life. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again soon if you're in the Omaha area and coming, able to come to one of our campuses. So well, I want to jump in. Got a lot to cover today. I'm really excited about what God has for us and just our study of Jesus. So let's pray and then we'll jump in. Father, I thank you again for every person that has gathered to watch and listen. And Lord, I believe that God, there is a divine appointment that you're establishing for all of us. The Lord, you're constantly orchestrating our steps that we might know you. And so, Lord, I pray today as we go through the message and we look at the, the cross and the crucifixion of Christ, that, God, you would open up our eyes and our hearts to receive and, and to really respond in a way that honors and glorifies you. Lord, let it be so. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, we are continuing our study of the life of Jesus as found in the book of Matthew. And uh, what we've been doing in this series, particularly, is studying the passion of Christ, which is that last few days of Jesus' life, his crucifixion, and then the resurrection, which the resurrection is next week with Easter. We're looking forward to that. So it's been kind of a good, cool study. Kind of hard, though, kind of heavy at the same time. What we're doing is we're uncovering what Jesus did for us on the cross and how it applies to our lives. I mean, trying to figure out what does this mean, you know? So one of the things I don't like about sometimes doing studies and things like that is it feels like a story or just feels like a thought that's out there and we don't really work at trying to make it part of who we are and so hopefully that's what happens in this series so check out what Paul said though we're using one of his statements for our key text about the passion of Christ and what it meant to him it's found in Galatians chapter 2 here's what it says it says my old self he's talking about his old way before Christ my old self has been crucified in other words the old me died the old me is dead and gone, but the new one is alive and well in Christ. He goes on, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And by the way, let me just stop right there. That is an amazing story to be told in your own life. When you come to the point where you realize, hey, the old me is gone. It's, it's, it's a past thing. It's, it's dead, but the resurrected me has come. It's a good thing. And, and if you experience that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And at the end, we'll pray, and you can maybe make that commitment yourself. But it goes on, he says, so I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, Jesus, who loved me. I mean, we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, this love I did from Jesus and this whole cross experience. And then this last phrase, we're going to really dive into this in just a second. It says, and gave himself for me. And gave himself for me. So last week, like I already said, we talked about the passion of Christ and how he was driven by love and to serve and to rescue and all these different ideas. And it was because of Jesus' love that he remained silent, that he didn't actually call the angels and do all the things that he could have done. He didn't even defend himself when he could have easily defended himself. But instead, he willingly went forward to endure the cross for you and I. And so we're going to kind of pick up the story a little bit more and kind of dig into that idea. What does it mean when it says he gave himself for me? So I, I want to just, just dig into that, you know, that, that big part of the passion of Christ that's in that last statement of our key text. So here's my prayer, though. My prayer today is that this phrase that he gave himself for me would actually become part of who I am. Just like Paul said. I mean, this, that's who I used to be, but that, this is who I am. My life is based on this thought that he gave himself for me. And so I'm hoping that happens. Now, here's a question before we get jump into this. What's the most expensive gift you've ever given or been given? You know, I mean, I'm thinking over the years, I've had people give me some amazing gifts, especially in ministry, just blow your mind kind of things. But then I was thinking, you know, what, what, what's the greatest gift I've given? You know, because usually, here's how it works. The cost of a gift is directly related 
to the value of the relationship that we have with the other person. In other words, because of a love relationship, because of, of a compassion relationship, because of that, that kind of drives a big part of it. And then the other side of it is because it's what we have available. In other words, we, we have this, so we're able to give that. We can't give what we don't have, right? You know, and so I, th- I thought about this way. A few years ago, Jennifer and I were celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. Um, you know, 25 years, we got married when we were 18, you know, and 18, you, you don't have a lot of sense about you. You don't have a lot of sense about you, like in money either. You just don't have a lot. And so when we got married, we basically scrapped, scraped together, uh, to barely do a wedding, barely get rings, barely make anything happen. And so 25 years later, in a little bit better position in life, I thought, you know what? This would be a good time to get Jennifer a nice, better ring. And so by far, that's the biggest, greatest gift I've ever given to anybody. And obviously, it was to my wife because I love her so much. But, you know, just this idea, what's the biggest gift? Now, Jesus, in our story today or our talk today, he was giving himself. He was giving his life, the greatest gift ever, right? So what's up with Jesus giving himself for us. So I want to break down the phrase real quickly that it, that it says, gave himself for me. Here, here's that first part. It was given freely, right? It was given freely. He gave. You know, Jesus, Jesus's life wasn't taken from him. Nobody forced him to do it. Nobody tricked him to do it. It didn't catch him off guard. None of that is true. He freely gave it. Matter of fact, he willingly chose to give it. And so this idea that it was a gift, it's not something because it was given, something that I can earn. I actually just receive it freely. So that's a big part of this thought, thought idea with what Jesus did on the cross. It's not something that I can run around and, re- and earn. It's actually something I'm going to receive as a gift because he's given it. Here's a second thought is it was a personal sacrifice. It says he gave himself. He gave himself. Jesus did not give something that didn't cost him personally. It sounds a lot like a statement that David made uh, in the Old Testament. He said, I don't want to give any kind of sacrifice that didn't cost me sacrifice, right? And so Jesus gave himself. He didn't mail it in. He didn't, he didn't have somebody else do it. By the way, there was nobody else that could have done it, right? And so here he's in, he's in this, pos- this position where it's a personal sacrifice. Here's the third thought, is it was a directed gift. And this is kind of cool because really it says he gave himself for me. In other words, he he directed it right at you and I. It it wasn't like just throwing out there whatever, whoever, however. It was very specific for you and I. Jesus gave himself for me. He took my price and paid it himself. He took my debt and covered it himself. He did what he did on the cross for me and for you. And so that's a huge idea. So I think that's what's happening in that particular verse. Now, today we're going to be studying Matthew chapter 27. And in Matthew 27, I was telling the staff earlier today that we could have easily made this a 10-week series. I mean, there's just so much in Matthew chapter 27 because it's a depiction, if you will, or an accounting of what happened leading up to the cross and the death of Jesus. In other words, it's kind of laying it all out. I mean, all the Gospels kind of hit on it, but Matthew's got this, this storyline here, right, that we're going to look into. And there's two main thoughts that jump out from the account. I just want to highlight those, and then I want to kind of unpack the second one a little bit more, and then come back to, okay, what does all this mean, all right? That's where we're going to go today. So, so here's the first thought that jumps out, is that Jesus was innocent. He was innocent. I mean, this isn't a story in Matthew 27 that is talking about a criminal that got his justice. This is talking about an innocent man, the Son of God, who got injustice. He was innocent the whole way. See, Jesus was innocent, but check this out. He was crucified for the guilty. He actually died for those that were guilty. Jesus did not, did not get what he deserved. He received what should have been our punishment. I mean, that, that, that just blows me away. I mean, the whole time I've been preparing this message, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of rocked my world a little bit because I just realized once again how much Jesus did for me. I mean, he took my place. He, I was the guilty one. He wasn't. He was innocent. See, we are the guilty. In this story, in Matthew 27, in the crucifixion story, the guilty is you and I. I mean, it's kind of, a, kind of a hard thing to think about, but really that's the truth. Now, here's what happened in Matthew 27 then. So Judas, remember Judas, the betrayer? He realizes 
After he's betrayed Jesus with the kiss, right, the 30 pieces of silver, he tried to go give it back. They didn't want it and all that kind of stuff. You can read the whole thing. He realizes he's been part of a condemning, uh, part of condemning an innocent man to death. Check out what it says, Matthew 27, verse 4. Judas says this. He says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Innocent blood. So Judas, the betrayer, realized, wow, he's innocent. I knew he was innocent. I just, I just didn't like what was going on, right? That, I mean, that's, I think, what was happening. So Jesus then it goes on in 27. He says that stand, he stands before Governor Pilate, and, and Pilate, the governor, agrees to release a notorious prisoner instead of Jesus, who's innocent, Barabbas, who was really guilty, which is kind of an interesting little thing because I think what's happening there, it's almost like a little picture of what's going on with us. <laughs> here's Barabbas. He's guilty of all kinds of things. And then here's Jesus, the innocent one. Jesus goes to the cross and Barabbas is let free. Jesus is innocent. We're guilty it's the same kind of picture. And so not only that, but Pilate's wife, it says he has a dream, she has a dream. And in her dream, basically what happened is the, the spirit or, or an angel in the dream, uh, the Lord revealed to her that Jesus was innocent. And she went to Pilate and said, hey, don't get involved with this guy. He's innocent, right? Don't, don't be a part of it. And so Pilate gets warned of that, right? So Pilate then, governor, he attempts to wash himself of Jesus's death. I mean, which... You think about it, I don't know if you can do that. You can't just say, well, my hands are washed of this. I had no part of it, right? I, I don't think it works like it. Here's what, what happened with him. It is Matthew 27, verse 24, the second part of that verse. It says, I am innocent of the blood of, Jesus, of, of this just person. Other translations say this righteous man. In other words, he realizes this guy isn't guilty of anything, but I've got a crowd of people that are wanting this Barabbas, and I'm kind of in between stuff. And in some ways, I think Pilate was a little bit of a coward in the whole story. Now, here's, here's an interesting thought. It's interesting to me that Pilate did this because I think many of us today, we might be more closer to Pilate than we like to admit because we try to distance ourselves from Christ's death and not really make it something personal. We, we don't want to get in the middle of all that. It wasn't me. I wasn't guilty. <laughs> It wasn't, it wasn't, I'm not that bad, you know? And, and we kind of try to distance ourselves. And here's the problem. We can't. We can't do that. <laughs> It just isn't possible. See, there are those in the story, let me just go through it real quickly. There are those in the story, when Jesus gets crucified, there are those that are saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, right? There's those kind of people, they're just Jesus haters, right? They're, they're just people that are upset with the righteousness of God or the claims of God and all these different things. And then there's those in the story that are curious about who Jesus is. And maybe you're in one of those categories right now. That you're maybe kind of, ah, I don't want to have anything to do with him, or maybe you're just curious. But then there's those in the story that I think, like Pilate, they're, they're the ones that say, I'm uninvolved with him. In other words, I choose not to get involved in this. And the reality is you can't do that. It just doesn't work like that. You just can't say, I don't want to be involved in it, because here's the truth. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> our stories are intertwined with the Jesus story. If you're human... <laughs> Hear, hear me clearly. If you're human, you're entwined in this story. You're part of the story. You're part of what was going on. This whole thing is about you and me. It really is. Jesus stepping into humanity for humanity. That's me. That's you. It's part of it. We're all part of it. So, so that's the first thought. Jesus is innocent. Second part, though, is that Jesus paid a costly price or a high price, or a great price. I mean, he, he paid a costly price. See, the passion of Jesus was more than just a theory. It, it was more than just good theology. It was more than just an understanding, or a thought, or a feeling. I feel something, right? It was actually a costly price that was being paid by the Son of God. It was actually something that God was doing that was very expensive. I like to think about it this way. God looks at us and says, you're worth it. You're, you're actually worth it. You're worth me sending my son to purchase you. That's the storyline that's going on here. Here's what it says in John 15, verse 13. It says, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. It's this idea of Jesus laying his life down for us. Now, now I got to warn you. The next part of the story 
is PG-13. It, 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 it's, it's intense, right? Because the price that was paid by Jesus was intense. It was graphic. And I encourage you, if you've never went and watched The Passion of Christ, it's, a, it's an older film, but it's a very good depiction, I think, of what happened in these hours that we're going to look at. So I want to talk about four parts of this price that was paid real quickly, the flogging, the mocking, the crucifying, and the death. And just kind of roll through it and then get to the end and say, what's the point for us? What's, what, what's all this mean? So here, let's, get, let's start off. The flogging of Jesus, right? Or scourging. It's not a word we, we, don't, we don't use either one of these words really very much anymore. You know, scourging is this idea you're whipping somebody with a whip, okay? So here's what it's in Matthew 27, verse 26. So Pilate released Barabbas to them, the one that was guilty for the one that was innocent, and he ordered Jesus flogged. And he kind of did this, I think, in hopes that if he did that, maybe they'd kind of let him go and it'd be over and he could walk away. But really, it was all part of the master plan of God's payment for us, right? It says, he ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. <laughs> Sounds brutal. It is. Then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. So this is like step one. Step one to crucifixion was to be flogged or scourged with this whip that was there. And let me just kind of explain what it was. The blows from the whip were, let me, let me back up here. The blows came from a whip with many leather strands. And each of those strands had sharp pieces of bone or metal balls or pieces of metal on the ends of those straps. So you can imagine as it went down, it would dig into the flesh and then they'd zip it back out and how damaging it was in the process. And it opened up the back to raw flesh. It was gruesome. It, it, was, it was incredibly gruesome. that this happened. And, it, and it wasn't unusual for a criminal to actually die from the flogging before they even got to a crucifixion. Before they even got to that point, because it was so brutal, it was so devastating. And so intense pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock. In other words, it was so intense, it wasn't like a slap on the face. It was like, it was intense damage to the body. And Jesus was going through this. Now, here's an interesting thought that I came across, that that often the blows of flogging would lessen as a criminal confessed to his crimes. Remember what we talked about last week, that Jesus remained silent. Once again, Jesus remained silent because he had no crimes to confess. And so the blows continued. So the blows continued. And so before the crucifixion, Jesus was deeply and seriously wounded for you and I. So that's flogging, right? Here, here's the second thing, is mocking, right? I mean, Flogging by itself, we say, whoa, 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 this is intense, right? But now it comes to this like emotional, traumatic, and physical all at the same time mixed together. So what happens is they get done with the flogging, and then Jesus gets turned over to some soldiers, and the soldiers say, hey, we got the king of the Jews over here, and they invite a whole regiment to come and make fun of him and mock him. Here's what it says, Matthew 27, verse 28 through, 20, through 30. It says they stripped him, which... That by itself, just to be, you know, stripped of your clothes and your dignity and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and jammed it onto his head, which would pierce and poke holes all over his head and bloody his face and probably even worse, right? And they put it on his head and they placed a reed stick, just a little stick, like a little branch you'd find out in, you know, in the yard kind of thing, a reed stick in his hand as a scepter, and then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. And so when they got tired of doing this, then they led him to the next stage. And I'll be honest with you, this part here, I, I can't get away from it. It's, it, it, it's like, Lord, I, I think something's happening here that maybe we need to slow down and look at it, because here was what I wrote down in my notes. Do we mock Jesus today? Do we, do we not, not literally, but, but figuratively and, and spiritually, do we mock Jesus today? Do, here's what I was thinking. Do, do we call him king, but we don't truly honor him as king at all in our lives? Do we say we worship, but we don't really bow? 
I mean, do, do we go through all the motions of something and it's not real? I mean, this kind of just struck me. Do, do we give him lip service? Do we pretend? You know, we go through all the church things and all the religious things and it's really just pretending because the real me inside is not really remotely committed or I, I'm saying he's Lord of my life, but he's really not. I mean, this part just kind of convicted me a little bit. Do we dishonor him? You know, the whole spitting thing, you know? Do we beat him again and again and again? And I thought about Paul in Acts where it says, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And really in that instance, it was beating Christ by challenging the work of Christ, by going against the mission of God. I mean, so, I mean, all kinds of different thoughts here. But anyway, my thought with this is just simply this. May we decide to do the opposite of what these soldiers did to Jesus. May, may we be half as creative in devising honor for our king as these soldiers were in planning dishonor for him. May we, may we just give ourselves to some point in our life saying, Lord, I want to honor you. I, I want to honor you. I don't want to be even remotely close to this idea of mocking you. So kind of an interesting thought. But Jesus, so he's been flogged, he's been mocked, and now they lead him to the crucifixion. See, the criminal is usually stripped naked. And when I say naked, we're saying naked, right? We're not talking like he's got a little, you know, pair of Fruit of Looms on. That, that's not part of the storyline here. The, it's, it's gruesome and, and very undignified, right? And he's stripped naked, and, and his hands are tied to a crossbar, like a, like a piece of railroad tie, you know? Probably weighed somewhere between 75 and 125 pounds. So you got to imagine, I've just been beaten mocked, all this kind of stuff, and now they're tying this road tie, and we're going to go for a long walk, because that's what they did. And he, they would lead them to the scene of the crucifixion by as long as route as possible, so that as many people as possible might see him and take warning. You know, In other words, you don't want to be messing with the Romans. You don't want to be messing with these people, because they're going to do this to you. And I thought about it this way. To me, it says, Jesus was going on display for all to see, including you and I. Including you and I, that we would see the sacrificial love on display for all to see. And, and they travel, running through the, the town, and they do all these things. But here's what happens. Matthew 27, verse 32. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene. So he's just showing up to do some worship or business, right? And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And so Jesus was so badly beaten that he couldn't physically carry his own cross. He couldn't physically do it. From the scourging, from the beating by the soldiers, all these different things. And so Simon from Cyrene was forced to carry it for him. Now here's a real quick little thought. Simon could carry the cross, but he could not be the sacrifice. So you and I, the same thing. You and I, we can carry the cross. Jesus actually calls us to carry a cross every day. Carries a, carry a cross. Be followers of me, carry the cross. But to be the sacrifice, there's only one. There's only one person going to be that sacrifice. So even though Simon carried the cross, which, by the way, I did a little research, found out that his family was probably impacted by this and became followers of Christ because of this experience. Once again, divine appointment that God does. So, so then it goes on, it says, the soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall, but when he had tasted it, he refused to drink it. Here's what was going on. It was customary to give those that were about to be crucified a pain-numbing and mind-numbing drink. In other words, it was like a painkill. It was like a morphine of the day. You know, I'm going to shoot you up. You're not going to feel anything. It's all going to be good, right? And it was to lessen their awareness of the agony that was just around the corner in the crucifixion. In other words, it was a chance for escape. It was a chance to, to go through the motions and not have to feel what they were going through. I mean, to get to that gruesome place. And here's what happened. Jesus refused. Once again, Jesus refuses because why? He chose to face the spiritual and physical terror with all his senses fully intact. He wasn't going to just do it in a way, well, I, I made it. I didn't feel anything, and I made it. He wanted to be right there in the middle of it. Here's, here's verse 35. And after they nailed him, nailed him to the cross, after they nailed him to the cross, we're talking probably eight-inch spikes, right? Like, like big spikes, big hammer, boom, right? The soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice, and then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. 
In other words, they crucified him. They crucified him. And there, I was doing some study. There's different ways that the crucifixion could happen. But traditionally, we believe that it was more of a T-shape, maybe with a cross shape a little, because they put the sign of who, who he was above his head. So we get the idea that that's where we get the cross from, right? But they drove the spikes through his wrist right here. And the reason why they did it there is because after a while, the weight of his body would begin to sag because he wouldn't have any strength to hold himself up. And they didn't want his flesh to tear him fall off the cross. So they put the spikes in his wrists and then they kind of lifted him up a little bit, put spikes either through one, both feet or both feet together or one feet, foot separately from the other. And really what happened is eventually either the blood loss or suffocation would get the person that was on the cross. And so here's Jesus, he's on the cross and, and every blow, when I was thinking about it, they were driving those nails. Whoosh! Whoosh. It was sending shockwaves of pain through his body. And I thought about this for a little while because I think those, whoosh, whoosh, I think those echoes of God's grace are still echoing throughout time. I think right now they're still, whoosh, and you hear it. You hear grace and love making a sacrifice that nobody else would make, nobody else could make. Right there it was, this huge story of Jesus' death being nailed on Christ. The price was intense. So let me ask this question. How bad was the crucifixion? How bad was it? We actually get our English word excruciating from the Roman word out of the cross, or the Roman, Roman phrase out of the cross. I was thinking about well, excruciating. What's it? A few weeks ago, I had a migraine. I've never had a migraine, and it was excruciating. And I'm thinking what I experienced and what the cross meant and the crucifixion was probably that migraine times 10, right? Or, or, or maybe have you ever hit your finger with a hammer? It was actually not just hitting one finger, it was hitting one after another, after another, another, and then doing it again. It's that kind of pain, that kind of intensity of what was going on. So that in, thought, in light of that, consider how serious our sin must be in the sight of God, that God would require such a sacrifice for you and I. That all of a sudden, all of this comes to this culmination that Jesus was paying a price, a heavy, costly price. Here's the last part, is the death of Jesus. Matthew 27, verse 44, 45 and 46, and then on. It says, at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. So three hours of darkness Darkness did a little bit more study, found out that this is actually recorded in history, that around Jesus' time of his death, there was an eclipse that nobody could explain. It's actually part of history. You're like, wow, what? What are you talking about? This isn't like just a fable? No, it's actually part of history. Other people have recorded that something happened around this time of Jesus' death, and they can't explain it, but we know what it is. It says, at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock, and at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, very important phrase, because there was still some strength in him that he could do with a loud voice, because you would think about it, you're bleeding out, you're suffocating, you, you're probably, barely, I can barely talk, but he screams out, right? Eli, Eli, lame, sabachthani, sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And see, here's what was happening. On the cross, Jesus took himself, took upon himself the full weight of our judgment. It was in this moment where it was happening, where the whole thing was happening, where God started in the garden saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restore relationship. And, and where we're at today, looking back at it, it was happening right then. It was happening that he was taking upon himself the full weight of our judgment. And Jesus was experiencing two things from the Father. He was experiencing... Withdrawal, where the Father turned away, and he's also experiencing the wrath of the cost of our sin. I think that's why darkness was there. You think about darkness as the absence of light, right? It's the absence of his presence, possibly, that he kind of pulled away. I, kind of an inner, I can't explain it perfectly, but I know that that's part of it. It was this idea that he was experiencing God's righteousness and his justice at the same time, that Jesus was becoming our substitute, and he, and he was paying our price, a price paid. Then it knows, verse 50, says that Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. We know what he shouted because we can go to the other gospels, and what he shouted was, it is finished. It is finished. What's finished, right? 
And, and, and also we can see that once again, nobody took his life. He gave it away. He released his spirit. He freely gave it. John 19.30 says, it is finished. That's what Jesus said. It's, it's one word in the, the ancient Greek. It is tele, to tell less die, which means, I love this, paid in full. That's what it means. I mean, so Jesus, he, shout, he shouts, it is finished. And really what he was saying is, it's paid in full. I don't know about you, but that just gets me like overwhelmed with grace and love and excited at the same time. Because I realized that God was doing something very powerful for me. See, this was the cry of a winner. Because Jesus was fully paying the debt of sin that we owed. And it was finished. And he was winning on the cross, Right? So it goes on, he says, at that moment, this, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This thick six-inch-like curtain all of a sudden just miraculously gets torn in two. The earth shook, the rocks split apart. I mean, there's powerful things, and the tombs open, and then you jump down to verse 54, and it says, the Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened, and they said, this man truly was the Son of God. He was innocent. He was paying something. He was doing something much bigger. Something was happening. So what's the point? Let me close. I think there's a couple thoughts, right? And obviously from the text that we just read, there's some points, but real quickly, these two things, and I'll give you the three fall in the blanks. One is let us not take or make the cross of Christ something cheap. I think it's that simple. I, I think it's important that we, we read this story afresh and we don't get so comfortable with it that we make it cheap because it's not cheap. The price that he paid was high and costly, right? And secondly, I think this, let us recognize very clearly that something extraordinary, something powerful, something impossible with an impossible God was taking place on that cross that day. Something for me. There's three things I think the price paid for, right? Here they are. One is the price provides forgiveness. Provides forgiveness. It says that darkness fell across the whole land. Kind of an interesting picture, but really what it was is that Jesus was paying for our judgment. The full weight of our sin was being placed upon him. And at this moment, there was a holy transaction. Jesus was giving himself for us. There was a trade in heaven that was taking place, and God was receiving a substitute and a payment for our sin. God the Father regarded God the Son as if he were a sinner. Check out what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. It says, He made him, God the Father, who knew no sin, to be sin in our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, this holy trade that was taking place. My sin put Jesus on the cross. And I love this because Jennifer used to say it for years when we, we were up in North Omaha. When Jesus was on the cross, you and I were on his mind. That's just as simple as I can say it. Here's the second thing the price of his payment paid. The price provides access. It says the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. What's it talking about? It's talking about this, this holy of holies, this inner place that is the presence of God where, where everybody but the priest was able to come. I mean, every, the priest was only able to come and everybody else was left outside. And, and, and at that moment that Jesus died on the cross, it was ripped open so that all could have access to a relationship with the Father. I didn't have to go through a priest. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go anywhere. I, just, I can go right to the Father through Jesus. I go right to the Father through Jesus. Jesus paid for our entrance, not just entrance for those that are lucky or those that are gifted, but I love this, for the notorious, <laughs> for you and I. No longer any separation because of our sin, and we all have full access to the Father. Last point is the price provides freedom. It's an interesting little story here, and I'm not going to get into it very deeply, but it says that the tomb's opened. You know, the rocks were splitting, the, the ground was shaking, the, the darkness was, I mean, it was a powerful moment, but, but it says the tombs had opened, that even people that were dead came alive, and they walked around. I'm sure they died later, because it, it didn't say that they were, like, forever resurrected, kind of like Lazarus being raised from the dead. He lived for a while and eventually died. But, but somehow, there's this powerful thing, but I think it speaks this, that Jesus paid for our chains to be broken. 
for our prison doors to be open, to free us from the grip of sin and death. Check out these two verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23. It says, God paid a high price for you. I love that. God paid a high price for you. So if you ever thought you're not, your life isn't valuable, right there says just the opposite. You're valuable. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved to this world. In other words, don't be run by the world's way of being under the control of sin and all the junk that goes with that. Here's another verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, 19. It says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life. <laughs> I love that. You inherited from your ancestors. In other words, the things that you've been doing all this time that just didn't amount to anything. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. In other words, Jesus became your payment. So here's, here's my closing thought. It is a terrible thing to be forced to endure such torture. It was a high price. It was a costly price. But to freely choose it out of love, it's remarkable. It's amazing. I mean, it's something that doesn't even make sense. It's incredibly, I mean, it doesn't make sense. So how could we ever doubt God's love for us ever again? God has gone to the most extreme length, to the extreme place to demonstrate that love for you and I. And here's my last thought, and we'll pray. The love kept Jesus on the cross, not the nails. It, it, it wasn't anything else other than his love for you. And here's the thing. It goes right back to where we kind of started. I can't earn it. I just got to receive it. And that's why faith is so important. I put my faith in the work of Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you today for all that you did on the cross. God, I can't even say it in words that feel like they mean even remotely close to what it is. But Lord, thank you. And Lord, I pray for everyone that is watching that, God, we would look afresh and anew upon the work of the cross and know that the price that was paid was costly and high, but it was all for me because you love me. Lord, let me, let me see that clearly by the Spirit. And Lord, I pray for anybody today that's watching that has never said yes to the Lordship of Jesus. So maybe you move from crucify him or curious about him or or I'm uninvolved with him to saying, Lord, I want to embrace you fully and receive the forgiveness that you're offering me on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's not stop there. You know, I think the last three points that the price provides forgiveness, it provides access, and it provides freedom. I don't know, but that spoke really just a ton to me. And I know you may say, Matt, you're the operations pastor. I'm telling you, God, what he did for me, what he did for all of us just impacts me still today. It's just an amazing thing that we have this gift from God, right? This, the, the, what he did for me to provide freedom so I don't have to be tied to the, my old ways of life. And I know I talked about that a couple weeks back, but I have freedom in Christ. It's amazing. It's awesome. And I hope that today you prayed that prayer with Troy that you took that step to say, I'm deciding to follow Jesus. Now, I wanna encourage you, if you're a guest with us today, or if you prayed that prayer, to go out to southridgelife.com and fill out the response card. On that card, it asks for a couple things, a piece of information to connect with us, and we wanna send you and partner with you about that decision and, and give you any, un, any information that we have to partner with you, okay? So make sure that you do that. I just wanna encourage you to do that and connect with us. The other thing is, those of you who call Southridge home, also you can give online. We talked about Kingdom Builders. We talked about our tithes. You can do that all via online. And remember, Kingdom Builders, one day to feed the world offering on Easter Sunday. So make sure that Easter you log in and you, you sign up to give your one day's wages or whatever it is, being obedient to God and what he would have you give for that day. So Easter Sunday, that's the one day to feed the world Kingdom Builders offering, okay? Next up is we're going to take some time to worship. So we're just going to take a little bit of time to pause and reflect and, and just see what God is speaking to you. What he's speaking to me. So let's just take a few minutes, pause a little bit, and reflect on that. Okay? So let's, 
I'll see you back afterwards.
Thank you so much for connecting with us here today. We really appreciate it. You know, we're, we do this. There's lots of other message series all here on YouTube or online. You can find them all through the website. I want to encourage you that um, the, the next step might be for you is to, to do that response card, right? To connect with us or maybe it's to come and visit one of our campuses. Again, we have two locations here in the Omaha area. So make sure that you check it out, see what the times are and visit with us. We'd love to see you back at one of the campuses. If you have any questions or concerns, there's all those emails, all the details to find out that info all online. That's southridgelife.com. Well, have a great week get geared up. I'm excited about Easter. I hope you are too. And we'll see you next time.